Here we are again, actually, in the book of Acts for a number of weeks, at least last week and some of the weeks before. And these acts, as they are recorded in Scripture, are really more the acts of the Holy Spirit than they are of the apostles, although the apostles are always present and sometimes participating. Today's story is one that is really critical to your and my presence here today. Had the events described here never taken place, most of us probably wouldn't be here today. Even here may not be here, that is, church. Because I contend that there would be no church, or if there was, we would not know what it was like as those who come from the Gentiles if the Holy Spirit hadn't been both patient and persistent enough to enlighten Peter about how big and deep and wide God intends for the church to be. If there is a theme for the book of Acts, perhaps it would be the reply. It's bigger than that. Because as the book continues, we understand that more and more people are called to be church. And our text for today is a repeat of the three-peat for the sake of the presbytery, at least when this same thing happens here in Middle Tennessee among our congregation, it will be for the sake of the presbytery. But in first century Palestine, it was actually for the sake of the council at Jerusalem. Now remember where we left Peter last week? He was riding high, if you will, on Tabitha's return from the dead. I'm not going to call that resurrection because unlike what God did for Jesus, Tabitha eventually went the way of the universe. Her star burned up and she faded into history like all of us will. So Peter still, though, is a distinguished guest in Joppa hanging out with Simon the leather worker. Now, I got to say, Peter's mama must have never taught him to cook, or at least he was too busy being a disciple or an apostle or whatever he was doing that he doesn't have time to cook because the point is that someone else had to cook for him. And in our story for today, that's precisely what we are retelling here before the council in Jerusalem. Peter is hungry and someone else is cooking for him and he's up on the roof on the top deck, if you will, praying while someone else is downstairs preparing him a meal because he is hungry, the book of Acts tells us. And in the middle of this prayer respite, he enters into a trance. Maybe it's the tantalizing smell of lunch on the open fire spiraling up the staircase that mesmerizes him and begins this trance. But however it begins, he falls into a vision of faith. It is a very specific, very dream, weird, and very eye-opening vision. A large sheet or something like a carpet is lowered by its four corners from the heavens down right in front of him. And in it is pretty much every animal he can imagine. Camels, pigs, goats, crocodiles, birds, you name it. So, just in case you're wondering when that happens here, it's going to be possum, raccoons, gators, maybe even a rattlesnake or two. Yeah, it's that weird. And so, here is where the dream gets really weird because a voice interrupts the weirdness of this animal panoply and Peter recognizes the voice. And he is sure that this voice belongs to God. The voice says, in essence, cook for yourself and don't leave anything off the menu. Oh, Houston, we have a problem. Yes. This is far more than food allergies or discriminating palate. This is religious identity. It's faith foundational behavior specifically faith forbiddings that go all the way back to the formation of God's people 
of which Peter is a part. It's the way that Peter has interpreted scripture and lived it in the here and now since the way back when. Leviticus is one of those places where all of this is spelled out. There is a specific list of do's and don'ts. And menus are a significant part of this list. So what happens? Peter isn't falling for this right away. You might say he calls God on this. Perhaps his questioning is not so much to tout his own obedience as to do an identity check on this voice. You never know when someone will steal God's identity and convince you to jailbreak your faith practices. That's always a risk, isn't it? Peter says, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. And in a self-assurance and reassurance that is reminiscent of Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush, God stands firm in self-identity. This time, his I am who I am, which is what he said to Moses, sounds more like this. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. Now, Peter is not so easily convinced. He's going to check all three major credit score companies before he signs on for this mortgage. Yes, that's right. God has to repeat the whole thing. Animals let down on a sheet, command to include them all, Peter's refusal, God's clarification, all of it three times before Peter is convinced to let go of this understanding and his cherished tradition. Now, at the same time that Peter is experiencing this faith quake, if you will, a Gentile man of faith named Cornelius is having a vision of his own from God in Caesarea. His is much simpler. God says to him, in essence, send someone to Simon the leather worker's house and get Peter because he has a message for you. Now, curiously enough, Cornelius doesn't require a three-peat in order to participate. Once is enough. And by the time Cornelius' men arrive, Peter has finally been convinced by God that it's okay to go with them even though they and Cornelius are among those whom Leviticus says Peter should steer clear of. And by the time Peter gets to Cornelius' home, the animal vision that he had has become a metaphor. He moves, if you will, from menu to metaphor. And Peter realizes that when God said, what God has made clean, you must not call profane, God wasn't just speaking about what's for dinner, not just speaking about the menu, but also speaking about faith and what would become church and life. So Peter lets his holiness guard or his hair down, if you will, with Cornelius and his family and friends. And guess what happens? Pentecost breaks out all over again just like it did when the disciples were gathered in chapter 2. Now, Peter has no choice but to baptize these new believers, to accept them into full membership and participation in the church. And he borrows the sentiment of the Ethiopian eunuch from chapter 8, who found God in the wilderness with Philip when he was reading the scripture. And Philip ran alongside his chariot and said, would you like for me to explain that to you? And climbed into the chariot and rode for a while with him. And when the eunuch finally understood what the scriptures meant and understood what it meant to be a faithful follower of God, the eunuch said, as they came upon a body of water in the wilderness, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? 
And the answer, of course, was nothing. And so when the Holy Spirit falls upon Cornelius and those who are gathered with him, all Gentiles, mind you, Peter explains it this way to Presbytery's council. He says, If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? Who was I that I could hinder God? So does this mean that Leviticus and perhaps all of the Hebrew scriptures are bogus and that we can disregard them? Not the way I see it. Not at all. Leviticus, Leviticus is a message and the whole wilderness message is a message to a particular people in a particular place at a particular time, but it is not God's once and for all message to everyone. If it were, we wouldn't need the rest of Scripture. It would just stop right there with Leviticus 11, the menu and everything, and we'd say, oh, that's how we worship, let's go do it. But the story continues. Because the same people do not stay in the same place. And even when they do, it turns out they're not the same people after a while. Leviticus and the whole of the wilderness journey and entry of the Egyptian exiles into the promised land are about the formation of a people. About a people who did not even have an identity when they were called out as slaves from Egypt into the wilderness. And it took them that whole 40 years and then some to begin to understand their identity. To use the creation language of Genesis that is described, it is about creation ex nihilo. That is about making something out of nothing. That happens in the wilderness or more specifically like the creation story making useful order out of useless chaos. That is precisely what is happening in the wilderness and that is what the people needed before they could go forward. You might say then and I would say that God built the house of Israel so that they could invite guests over all the time. Yes, church is primarily a hospitality thing. God's guides for identity formation as handed down to us through Leviticus and the whole of what we call the Old Testament were never intended to create insiders and outsiders, good and bad, churched and unchurched. No, that's not what they were intended for at all. They were intended to help us see the amazing promise and potential that each and every one of us and us collectively have by way of grace. That's what they were intended to do, to open grace to us. And once we understand that it's grace and only grace by which we receive these gifts and through which we act, then we're the ones that are supposed to send out the invitations and open the doors. The church keeps finding out it's bigger than that. And here is the part where we became the bigger that came into the church. I charge you as those who have heard the good news to remember that you have received Christ's gracious invitation and you are already beginning to open and use it. And I charge you to send your own invitations this day and each day. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Creator, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore.